morning. It's great to see lots of smiles now. <laughs> um, you may have noticed from the announcements, we had the go-ahead this week for Rattlesnake Point Sunrise Service on Easter Sunday morning. Um, we, uh, they're opening the point for us early, and they've asked that we prepay for everyone who's going to go. So, unlike other years, we're asking you to pre-register. We're going to have the online registration open during the week, but if you want to register with me after the service, you can do. Um, if you're interested in sponsoring a ticket, we don't want anyone to feel that they can't come because they can't afford it. So if you'd like to sponsor a ticket, you can let me know and we can hold some in reserve for anyone who um, can't afford to pay the entry fee. If you have a membership of the Holton Parks, you get in for free. So we just need your membership number and how many people you're bringing with you. Um, I've done it for 10 years and I, d I think I've had pretty much every sort of weather. So we've had it foggy so you can't even see the sunrise. We've had snow like today and we've had warm weather. But I have to say, Whatever the weather, whether you see the sun or not, it is a really nice way of starting um, Easter Sunday morning. It's a little bit early. Sunrise is at 6.34 a.m. <laughs> but it's definitely worth getting together, ha taking a walk up there, and uh, starting Easter Sunday off in a really great way, praising God. And that's what we're going to do now. So I'd invite you to stand with us. Um, I'm not going to tell you to sit and stand through the service. It's something that I find really difficult. So please feel free, as we're singing all the songs, to stand or sit however you want to do um, during the service. You're welcome.
All right. So my name is Miss Susan, and this is the kids' lesson of the of the service. But I know that there are lots of adults who like this part of the service as well. So I'm hoping that I have some kids out there who know how to read. So I have a word here, and I'm wondering if any of the kids can tell me what word this is. Any brave kid? Yeah, Gemma. It says friend. Good. And I know I had a hand up back there. Sorry, I didn't get to everyone. But yes, friend. It says friend. And today we're going to be talking about some of the friends that Jesus had when he lived on the earth. So I'm sure that some of the kids here have have heard about Jesus' disciples. So there were 12 men who um, they lived with Jesus, they learned from Jesus, they traveled with him, they were together all the time. So as much as they were like his students, right, I said they like learned from him, they were also his friends. Because if you spend that much time with someone, you get to know them really well. And so of those 12, there were three of them that he was even closer with. So we hear a lot in the Bible about Peter, James, and John. So they were like Jesus' closest friends when he lived here on the earth. And of Peter, James, and John, there's one that we hear about even more than the others, and that was Peter. So we hear a lot about Peter in the Bible. And so we know that Jesus and Peter were very good friends. And so we're going to talk about one, there's many stories about Peter and Jesus, but we're going to talk about a couple of them today. And so the first thing we're going to start off with is near the end of Jesus' time on the earth. So Jesus is about to be arrested, and then after that he will be crucified. And Jesus is having supper, a dinner, with his disciples. We call it now the Last Supper. And during that, Jesus has a conversation with Peter. And so he tells Peter, before the rooster crows, you are going to deny me three times. So before the sun up, you know that we have the rooster, we go cock-a-doodle-doo, when it's morning time, right? So before that happens, that Peter's going to deny him three times. And denying him is like pretending that he didn't know who he was. So remember that they're very close friends. And Jesus says he's going to pretend that he doesn't know who he is. So a little while later, they've finished their meal, they've gone out, and Jesus has been arrested. So Peter is curious about what's going to happen, but he's probably also scared. Like he's scared about what's going to happen to Jesus, but maybe also scared about what might happen to him, right? Because he's like, oh, well, what if they find out that like I know him? Like what if I get arrested or what if I get hurt in some ways? So he kind of follows along to see what's going to happen, but he follows at a distance because he's like, I'm kind of scared. So Jesus ends up getting taken to the high priest. And so Peter ends up in the courtyard outside of the high priest's home. And there is one of the servant girls comes up to him and says, you're not one of Jesus' disciples, are you? So what do you think he's going to say? So remember, Jesus said, you're going to pretend that you don't know me. And this is when it happens. So Peter says, no, I'm not one of his disciples. So then next, he is like warming himself by the fire because it's, it's cold, it's outside, it's nighttime. And so he's getting himself warm and then he's, someone else comes up to him and says, you're not one of his disciples, are you? And he says it again. He says, nope, that's not me. I'm not one of his disciples. And then the last time, he, there is one of the high priest servants that comes up to him and didn't I see you in the olive grove with him which is where Jesus got arrested and he's like nope you must have been thinking about someone else that's not me not much of a friend anymore now right yeah and I want the kids to think now what Jesus might have thought in this moment so Jesus knows that Peter has done this right he knows that one of his closest friends has pretended to not even know who he was Do I have any brave kids that might tell you how you might feel? So if one of your closest friends pretended that you didn't exist, maybe ignored you in the hallway at school, then you called after them and they're like, who are you? How do you think you would feel if that happened? Do I have any brave kid that might be willing to answer when there's all these adults looking at them? And it's okay if you don't answer. I'm totally fine with that. But I know if it was me, I think I'd be pretty sad. 
right? Because that would hurt me. I'm like, oh, my good friend just pretended that as if they didn't know me. So I'm, I'm sure that Jesus probably felt the same way as well. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. So Jesus is arrested, he's crucified, and then he comes back to life. And now we're going to have a story then after Jesus comes back. And we get to see how Jesus reacts to this. So I think about a couple of options of how people might react if their friend upset them in this way. One thing is that they might have been really angry, right? And so this might have been Jesus' chance to like yell at Peter and tell him, I needed you the most in that moment. It was the most difficult time and you weren't there for me. So that's one way he could respond, right? Getting really angry and yelling. Another way that he could respond, a different personality, and we've talked about different personalities lately. So another personality might not like to argue, might not like conflict. They probably were still upset about it, but they might be like, oh, I, I don't know that I want to talk about it or bring it up. So then it just becomes awkward, right? So it, it maybe it's someone that just doesn't talk to that person anymore. That's really awkward. Or it's just you talk, but it's just not the same. The friendship isn't what it was, right? So that's maybe two options of how Jesus could respond. But it's not how Jesus responded. So Jesus knew that he needed to have a conversation with Peter. He knew their friendship wasn't what it was, and he knew he wanted to make that better. But he was so kind and gentle in the way that he did it. So he just asked Peter one question, and he asked it three times. So he asked, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. See if I can get this to work here. And then he asked the question again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you, Lord. And then he asked it one more time, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know all things, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus knew that that's exactly what Peter needed. Because three times Peter pretended not to know Jesus. And so three times he gave him the opportunity to tell him he loved him in ways that he didn't show it before, right? So he had three times to be like, he didn't show the love. And so he was able to tell Jesus that he loved him. So Jesus knew that that conversation needed to happen and that that friendship needed to be restored. So we can learn from that. We can always learn from Jesus and how he does things. That maybe this week, maybe you have some sort of a difficulty with a friend. And I want to encourage you to be brave, to like talk to them about it, but also to be kind and gentle in that conversation. So that's the end of the lesson. And now the kids can go upstairs with Miss Mary. Do you know, it's always a challenge following up Mary and uh, <laughs> Susan after they come and give their <laughs> energetic little talks to the kids and all, to all of us, and uh, you do such a, such a great job. How many English people are here with mothers in Britain? One. Oh, we don't have a mother in Britain anymore. Anybody else? Well, it's Mothering Sunday in Britain today, so may God bless the mothers in Britain and their children uh, who are over here not able to give them a hug, but I'm, sh I'm sure you're sending virtual hugs. Talking of England, uh, I'd like to uh, give a warm welcome to Claire Hickson, uh, Lily and uh, Max. They uh, arrived here, well, Claire and S Simon, and uh, Lily and Max arrived here from Dubai in December. Can you imagine that? from Dubai to Canada in December. <laughs> so they've just about made it through their first Canadian winter and they're still alive. <laughs> Barely. Barely, yeah. Anyway, welcome. Yeah. It, it wouldn't take you two nanoseconds to figure out she's from England. <laughs> I think uh, as she was coming through the door, Ian said hello to her and that's all she needed to say. N.T. Wright, often quoted in this uh, hallowed place, uh, he wrote, the mission of the church was, the church began with three things, tears, 
Lock Doors and Doubt. Tears, Lock Doors and Doubt. And he was drawing uh, from the events recorded in John 20, of course. But when I read this statement, I, it caused me to ponder on its applicability throughout the history of the church. And, um, you know, we can think of the Roman persecutions in the early church, uh, the Inquisition, Luther's Reformation, uh, the nonconformist uh, movement in, in, in Britain, and how such challenging times served to strengthen and spread, the Christ, spread Christianity. And I cannot help but think uh, of tears, locked doors, and doubt in the context of the war in Ukraine. And just as the disciples found Jesus coming to meet them in their tears, fears, and doubt in unimaginable ways, we can be assured that he is making himself present in Ukraine. His presence will be felt through the countless acts of kindness of his followers in Ukraine, in those supplying or working in refugee relief centers in the neighboring countries, and evident in the leaders of many nations that are offering support. And as just as Christ miraculous, miraculously appeared to the disciples, there will undoubtedly be many miraculous encounters in Ukraine. Because we know the promise is, I will never leave you or forsake you. As Christians, we long for the new heaven and the new earth where there is peace everlasting. And as we just sang, where every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. And we sang, King of heaven, come now, let your glory reign. So, Lord, let your glory reign so that the words of the prophet Isaiah become real. I shall come, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, and many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations, and shall decide disputes from many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Would you pray with me now for the people of Ukraine? <coughs> King of heaven, we pray for, the, for peace for the people of Ukraine, that you bless their leaders with wisdom and discernment and persever perseverance needed to maintain the sovereignty of their nation. Give strength and courage to the Ukrainian armed forces who are endeavoring to protect their nation. Bless the Ukrainian citizens with protection and safety from the, all the harm and horrors of war. Comfort those who grieve, heal those that are wounded, Lord, may they hold on to a hope for a peaceful future for their country and the reuniting of their families. We pray for the nations who are providing aid to Ukraine and place economic sanctions on the aggressor in an effort to bring about peace. Lord, bless the peacemakers. For the Ukrainian families the world over who are watching anxiously from afar, Lord, comfort them and bless them with your compassionate presence. Lord, we cannot help but think of the Russian soldiers who have been forced into this battle. Lord, we remember them and their, an and their anxious and grieving families. Dear Lord, bring a halt to the carnage in ways that only you can for your glory. We pray that each of us play a part in supporting the people of Ukraine. Show us the way, Lord, however small. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign. And all God's people said, Amen. We'll now watch a uh, video recorded uh, by Father Mark Curtis. Most of us here know Father Mark, the singing priest of Milton. 
and he has uh, written and uh, dedicated this song to the people of Ukraine. And after that, we'll have the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> And the world cries once again Tears of fear they never end When will hearts start to defend A world of love where peace is a friend Peaceful skies and silent nights this my prayer I hope takes flight Peaceful skies and silent nights This my prayer I pray with all my might This my prayer I pray with all my might What a wonderful world it could be if all hearts would one day agree Color blind love always sees The gift of same in you and me Peaceful skies and silent nights This my prayer I hope takes flight Peaceful skies and silent nights This my prayer, I pray with all my might This my prayer, I pray with all my might skies and silent nights This my prayer I hope takes flight Peaceful skies and silent nights This my prayer I pray with all my might This my prayer I pray with all my might Peaceful skies, silent nights. Peaceful skies, silent nights. Peaceful skies. It's rather lovely, isn't it? Peaceful skies and silent night. May that come soon to Ukraine. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come soon, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. The kingdom, the power, and the glory belong to you forever. Amen.
About, and I was trying to figure it out this morning, 25 years ago, when you get to be this old, 10 years come, they go, it's 25 years come and gone. I went to my office um, and I noticed on my desk a pile of, of letters and sort of read through them and paid attention to what I should. And there was one letter that said that I had been invited to join a tour to Israel, all expenses paid. And I think I'd seen that kind of letter many times, so I just left it on my desk and um, thought, yeah, I mean, what's the catch? Are you trying to recruit me to be a tour leader and letting me have a quick fam tour, as they call them? So I left it there. And about two weeks later, I had a phone call, and the, the phone call was from a fellow that I knew. And he said, Ian, are you not interested in the tour to Israel? And I said, well, come on, it's, w what's the catch? He said, there's no catch. I said, there's always a catch. There's no catch. The deal is this. There was a family at York Minster Baptist Church in Toronto, and they were very wealthy, and they had money that they wanted to invest in pastors mid-career. They wanted to know what would be the one thing that we could do that would encourage pastors and get them into maybe the second half of their career with, with kind of some wind in their sails. So he said... What they have decided to do is fund an all-expenses-paid trip to Israel for two weeks. And it was all-expenses-paid except for lunch, if you wanted to buy lunch. But if you've had an Israeli buffet, you know that you've got enough buns to stick in your pockets and to get you through lunch. But he said, that's all it will cost. And he says, we're, you'll be staying in four or five-star hotels. You're, you'll be going to every you know site that you would love to be at in Israel. So what do you think? And I said, well, I have to talk to Annabeth. And I went home and I said to Annabeth, I think there might be a catch. But Dick Holliday called me and said, there's no catch and he wants us to join this tour. So we did. And it was one of the most delightful things that we have ever done. And the result of it was that we went back another time and actually did bring a tour by ourselves. But uh, in Israel, there are many, many lovely spots. This one that you see right here is the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it's a w wonderful place. It can you know, whip up into a storm in moments and become a ferocious place. But when it's calm and lovely, um, it, it is just beautiful to walk along the shores 
of Galilee and maybe climb up on the hills that rise up from the shores. So um, the whole idea of going to Israel and sort of walking where Jesus walked has, has become kind of a, it's kind of a meme, actually. And we were talking this morning, or John was, about Mothering Sunday. So one of the things that English people love is the song Jerusalem, which is an absolutely ridiculous song, right? Because here's what it says. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? No. I don't know where they got that, but they sing it gloriously. You have choirs, um, and, and it's a lovely song, but it's nonsense. So we had the opportunity to walk where Jesus walked. We would kind of joke with one another when we were there that today we walked maybe where Jesus walked. Because some of the places that were um, sort of honored and, and through the years have become more and more holy, you think, was, was that really where that happened or, or whatever? But there was one place that um, is one of the high, most highly attested sites in the land of Israel. Um, it's on the shore of Lake Galilee, and it's the Church of the Primacy of St. Peter. And in that church, and you can see the rock beginning outside the church, Inside the church, there is actually the rock on which they believe, and has, it has been attested that Jesus had breakfast with his disciples, the breakfast that Susan told us about. Um, we were there the second time and had a tour guide who was a wonderful woman. She was a very modern Israeli. She was not a Jewish person by faith, but she was an Israeli um, by nationality and commitment. And she was a botanist, so she had incredible wisdom about, you know, the, the geography and, and uh, flowers and trees of the land. But when we got to Mensa Christi, as it is identified here, she called it Mensa Domini. So Mensa Christi means table of Christ. Mensa Domini means table of the Lord. So I said, Tamar, why do you call it Mensa, Christ, Mensa Domini? It's known as Mensa Christi. She said, he may be your Christie, but he's not mine. And it led to engaging conversations to understand um, the sensibilities of modern Israelis and the things that have, have come their way along the way. Um, what happened here is one of the gentlest conversations that the pages of the Bible report for us. And there are all kinds of lessons about how to have a dangerous conversation, I'm sure, that we could eke from this. Um, there are all kinds of um, sort of principles about how to confront, how to deal with conflict and all of that. But it seems to me that the best way to approach this is just tell you the story and ask God to help us understand um, the power and the dynamics of this story of a very difficult conversation between Jesus and Peter. What was it that needed to be talked about? What was it that needed to be said? So the whole story begins with uh, a, a boat with disciples, fishermen, on the lake. And they fish all night. And the irony of the fact that they are fishermen and fish all night without catching anything is not lost on us. They all had left their nets when they began following Jesus. And he told them that they would become fishers of men. Now, after the debacle of their either um, denying Jesus or walking away from him, they go back to fishing. So there's a telltale verse early in John chapter 21 where Jesus um, is not present with them yet, um, but they are all by themselves probably sort of licking their wounds and trying to figure out how they will move on from here. And Peter said, I'm going fishing. It wasn't just a casual, um, I have nothing else to do today, or I've thought about going fishing again. What Peter meant by that was, I quit. I'm going to go back to the only thing I know how to do, which is to catch fish. So because he was the ringleader, all of the other disciples said, well, we're going to go too. 
So they launch their boat onto the Sea of Galilee, and they fish all night long and cannot catch a single fish. A figure appears on the shore, and it was early morning, and they couldn't quite see who it was. Maybe it was a little foggy or hazy. And the person on the shore calls out a question. And the question is a very telling one, and it's, it's actually a, a, a very embarrassing one. So if, if you're asking a yes or no question in Greek, you ask the question anticipating the answer. So we would say, um, did you do this? And the answer would be yes or no. In Greek, you would have to say, you didn't do this, did you? Expecting the answer no. Or you did do this, didn't you? Expecting the answer would be yes. You can't be um, you, you know, kind of cagey about the thing. You ask what you expect is the answer. The character on the shore called out the question to the disciples who had not caught any fish. You don't have any fish, do you? How embarrassing to be outed um, about the fact that even though it's the only thing you know how to do, you're a professional, somebody is calling you out and saying, I don't think you have any fish, do you? And then, to add insult to injury, the person says, well, why don't you try fishing on the other side of the boat? And I'm sure something, when you fished all night long, and you've been unsuccessful, and some character comes and says, why don't you try the other side of the boat? You go, yeah, yeah, why don't we try the other side of the boat? That's ridiculous. Probably it had to do with the fact that they were right-handed, not left-handed, and they fished on the side of the boat that was comfortable for them, but they said, let's do it anyway. They throw the nets on the other side, and they catch so many fish that they can't really even contain the catch, and they begin to try to drag it to the shore. In the meantime, someone says, I think I know who that is. It's the Lord. Peter throws himself into the water and makes his way to shore. So as we try to imagine um, the feelings of, of this incredible story, all of the things that have happened, all of the hesitations that Peter had, even though Jesus had, had specially messaged him and spoken to him, he was still sore from the fear um, the, the disorientation, the confusion over he had tried to do the right thing with Jesus and he basically had his, his wrist slapped. Um, when they tried to arrest Jesus, Peter grabbed a sword and tried to cut off a soldier's head. He wasn't good with a sword and he missed his head and only got his ear. And Jesus said, no, not, not like that. And Peter must have been going, well, I promised you I would defend you. I promised you I would be here for you. And now you're telling me not that way. I'm, I'm confused. I'm afraid because the soldiers have come and they have violently arrested Jesus. Um, and Peter, we're told, follows Jesus at some distance. And that night, as Susan said three times, um, he, he said he didn't know who he was. In fact, the one time, the last time, he, he said with foul Galilean fisherman language, I don't know him. There was a Galilean dialect, and there was the vocabulary of fishermen that was coarse, and Simon reverted to that in trying to deny that he even knew who Jesus was. Now all of the events of his death and resurrection have, have transpired. And they've tried fishing, can't find anything, fish can't catch anything, drag these fish into the shore. And the awkward time is come when Jesus, in front of all of Peter's friends, is going to have a conversation with him. So in John chapter 21, here's the conversation. It says, so when they had finished breakfast, Again, there's a lovely little twist to the story. When they get to the shore with the fish, Jesus already has cooked breakfast. 
Fish and bread on the griddle are all ready to go. I don't know what, what Peter's inner turmoil was like, but it seems to me it, it was, you know, pretty high. Um, this character on the shore, I don't hear Jesus calling to the fishermen, um, mocking them. I think there's just a little, in Ireland we used to say, half joking, whole earnest. You probably don't even know what that means. It, it means that you've got a tongue in your cheek. So Jesus, he's calling fishermen and saying, <laughs> you guys didn't catch anything, did you? And, you know, they're not infuriated, but when they catch this great draft of fish and get their way to the shore, Jesus already had cooked breakfast for them, and they ate breakfast. Did they eat it in silence? Did Peter, and we should call him Simon, that's what Jesus calls him now, um, did Simon make eye contact with Jesus, or did he try to look away? Did he try to talk about other things? Um, what was it like? When breakfast was over, Jesus looked across with all of the disciples, all the friends around. He says to Simon, Simon, do you love me more than these? Now, in Greek, as we've said several times, there are three words for love. Um, eros is the kind of sexual love. Um, phile is the kind of friendship, fond kind of love. And agape is the, the lovely kind of love that um, should mark followers of Jesus. They will know us by that agape love. Jesus asked Simon, um, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than they do? Do you love me with agape love? And I think he's referring to the other disciples because that's what Simon has claimed before. Even if they all walk away, I will not do it. So Jesus calls him and he says, So Simon, do you love me with the kind of committed, godly love that you profess more than they do? Um, so Simon is cut to the bone. First of all, that he's being called Simon. Because way back at the beginning, Jesus said, I know you, you're Simon, but I'm going to change your name. Uh, I'm going to give you a name um, that reflects the character that I'm going to develop in you. I'm going to call you a rock. And lately, Simon had not proven to be a rock. He was not dependable. He was not solid. He was wishy-washy. He was scared. Um, he was confused. And Jesus goes back to that original name, and he says, Simon, do you, do you love me with agape love more than these? And Simon answered, um, Lord, you know that I am fond of you. So there's the rub. He has promised Jesus the kind of committed love that Jesus deserves. And now when Jesus sees him again. He says, so Simon, and I'm going to call you that, do you love me with the kind of love that you should? And Simon says, I, I, can't, I can't promise you that. All I can say is, I am your friend. I'm fond of you. And then there was the awkward moment about, well, where is this going to go? And Jesus persists. The second time he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me with that agape kind of love more than these boys? And he said the second time, I'm, I'm fond of you. I, that's all I can promise. I, I've failed, I've messed up, but I want you to know I'm fond of you. And the third time, and the, the text says, and when we read it in English, we wouldn't catch this. Um, it says Jesus asked him the third time, and that Peter was grieved because he asked him the third time. He was grieved because the third time Jesus changed the question. He said, are you fond of me? And Simon was broken that Jesus would, um, you know, torque it down the question and say, I just want to know, are you fond of me? And Peter says, you, you know everything. You know that I'm fond of you. The responses that Jesus gives him each time are curious and 
scholars have tried to figure out what was meant by feeding lambs and tending sheep and looking after flocks and all of that sort of thing. I think very simply, what Jesus wanted to sow into the conversation was that this was not the end of mission for Simon. This was not the end of his discipleship. This was not the end of his call. But it was the means by which Jesus would show the character development that that he had effected in Simon's life. So he did not say to Simon, well, when you can come back with the right answer to, to the highest question, then you know, maybe we have a future. He didn't. He, he just left it with this commissioning that he still had a job for Simon to do. How, how was it that Simon was translated into Peter, to Petros, to the, to the rock? Um, Simon felt like it would be because he would, he, would, he would be what Jesus needed him to be. And so along the way, we see encounters between Simon and Jesus, and we see that it appear that, would appear that Jesus should be impressed with what Simon did. Like on, you know, at Banyas, the Caesarea Philippi declaration, where Jesus said, who, who do people say I am anyway? And they say, oh, some people say this prophet or that prophet. And Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it's it's on a huge outcropping of rock, and it probably echoed right over the, the pond in which the goddess Pan was supposed to live. In that pagan place, Simon declared that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus sort of stepped back and clapped his hands and said, right answer. Um, and the gates of hell will not stand against what I'm going to build. On this rock, I will build my church. Not the rock, Peter, we can go there some other time, but this confession. And, you know, you sort of see Peter going, there, I'm, I'm getting it. I, I had the right answer. I passed. Not long thereafter, and it's kind of curious to see who wrote this. It was one of the gospel writers. Um, Simon, Peter said something, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And it was like, oh, all of the inflation of his having been successful was deflated as he was called Satan and had to get behind Jesus. And he's going, I'm going to keep on trying. And then the pinnacle of his effort was, even if they all walk away, I will never walk away from you. And he did. And Jesus did not go after him on that. He went after on this one question, do you love me? And if, if Simon's spirit and mind were open, Jesus was asking him the question that would qualify him to be the Peter that preached on Pentecost, the, the Peter that you know, did amazing exploits. But Jesus did not want to know whether he had done enough for him He didn't want to know whether he had passed or failed on the mission of being a disciple. He wanted to know if if Simon loved him. And when we think about this kindness of God, the kindness of a king, um, where David says, is is there anyone left of the household of Jonathan so I can show Chesed, the kindness of, of, of God? When we look at the story of the prodigal son where a father was ridiculously loving and forgiving over a wayward son. And we come then to John 21 and we see friends, one of whom has thoroughly disappointed the other. And yet the kindness of God in Christ is that when it all boils down to what matters, it is the question do you love me? Jesus said to his disciples one day, "Um, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. I'm going to call you my friends. So servant doesn't know what his master is doing. You're my friends. And then on the matter of prayer, he says to the disciples, "Um, you can ask the Father for anything. I, I don't mean you can ask me to ask him for you. 
I, I'm not your patron. You can ask the Father yourselves because he loves you. And through the whole um, drama of the Bible, it's love that emerges. That when we say God is love, it's not just describing him and saying he's loving. God is, by nature, love. Jesus is our friend at the deepest, most profound level in which the currency of that friendship is love. Um, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a friend with whom you are deeply in love. And sometimes I feel like if the Spirit could only get into my heart and fix something so that I could believe that the way God relates to me and to you is love, purely love. And the relationship that we have with Christ, our friend, is love. And he wants to know from me and from you today, are, are you getting a glimpse of agape love in your relationship with me? If you tell me you're just fond of me, that, that's a good start. But if you can stretch to say, I'm, I'm beginning to understand the profound realization that when the Bible tells us that God loves the world, that God loves us, that the way that love is expressed is always extravagant. It's always over the top. What, what did each of these stories tell us? A king said, is there anybody I can show kindness to? Yes, there is a lame boy who's in hiding because he's infuriated by the fact that you killed his father. Um, he wants to bring that child to his table and look after him for the rest of his life. There's a son who lived a wanton life, who thinks about coming home. And when he thinks about that, he, he gets to realize soon that there's a father who's been watching for him to come. And there's a friend who, when he is disappointed by someone not meeting his promises, he says, you know what really matters? I love you. Do you love me back? Why don't we just pray? Father, uh, the stories of the Bible just engage us. And now this one, that's not, not just a story told by John, but it's, it's something that happened. And John right afterwards says, I was there. I saw everything that happened. I'm telling you the truth about what went on. And Father, as we think about that, that lovely lakeside setting and the serenity of the rock that's still there, uh, we think of a breakfast in which a very difficult conversation, because of the love and grace and mercy of Jesus, eased into just a comfortable solution, a, a comfortable conclusion um, to all of the terrible things that had happened leading up to it. Thanks for sharing that with us as your revealed word that gives us truth and wisdom and insight. In Jesus' name, amen.
love the way this little encounter ends up. Um, the text says that Peter looked around and he saw John. And he said, um, what about him? Isn't that very human? And Jesus said, what does that matter? If, if I should decide that he remains until I return, what's that to you? You follow me. And so there was a, a rumor went around that uh, John would not see death before Jesus returned. But I can just see Peter just feeling awkward. After, after the resolution of a difficult conversation, you, you're sometimes not quite sure what to do next. So you sort of look around and maybe think of a way to distract and say, what about him? And the point is, Jesus says, that, that doesn't matter. Our transaction is our transaction. I love you. Do you love me? That's what matters. So, God bless.